All right, good morning. Thank you all for coming. So when everybody puts talks together and everybody does it themselves and then you merge it, Charlie encompassed all the spine surgeries so we could just take a break now. So my disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, and I'm just going to go through this quickly. We'll talk a little bit about anatomy, axial neck pain, cervical herniations, stenosis, radiculopathy, myelopathy. If you leave here today and you remember one thing from this whole talk, it's the difference between radiculopathy and myelopathy. One slide on pathophysiology. We'll talk a little bit about physical exam, some treatment options. We'll take some questions. And above all else, we will finish ahead of schedule. So anatomic considerations. There are seven cervical vertebrae and eight cervical nerves. So there's a mismatch. And the nerve exits. Anatomy is very boring, but anatomy is the only thing that will never change in your whole career. So if you remember anatomy, you always get a couple of exam questions right. So uh, there's seven cervical vertebrae, eight nerves. So the nerve exits over the pedicle. And when you get to the thoracic spine, the nerve exits below the pedicle. Uh, so a C5-6 disc will hit the C6 nerve, and you'll get C6 pain. Uh, there's five joints in the cervical spine. There's three joints everywhere else. So we added these two uncovertebral joints, which are on the side of the disc. So you have the disc, the two joints on the side, and the two joints in the back, and you can get pain from anywhere. Uh, and let's just talk a little bit about the aging process. Because we expect an EKG at 50 to be normal or not normal. And a normal EKG at 50 looks a lot like a normal EKG at 30. But the spine and the whole musculoskeletal system starts to wear out essentially from birth. And that's the consequences of gravity and not living in the water. So my grandma Anna was four foot five. She was 94. And all the discs start to dry out as you get older and your hair starts to turn gray. And that is the natural history of aging. Uh, so we just have to sort out what represents a natural history of aging versus what represents you know, something that's truly pathologic. Because there's really nothing you can do to prevent or reverse the aging process. Because if I could do that, I would stop doing this. Uh, so just remember that asymptomatic MRIs, and I see this all the time. I saw a patient yesterday, so are you telling me that I do not have a bulging disc? I'm like, well, maybe you do, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, as we get older, the MRIs start to demonstrate the natural history of aging. And we, Charlie showed more studies, but these are just sort of the important ones that I picked. Uh, and I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about neck pain, but just neck pain is kind of like a head cold. Uh, it makes you miserable, and for the most part, it's self-limiting. Uh, there's a lot of things that cause neck pain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and most of these get better despite what we do, not necessarily because of what we do. Uh, so we'll just kind of leave that up to you. Uh, the things that cause uh, neck pain, strains, sprains, uh, acceleration, deceleration, most of this is self-limiting. This is not a surgical problem. Uh, you can get neck pain from any of those five joints in your back. In your neck, you can get uh, neck pain from muscles, ligaments. You do have to ask questions, though. Um, so when did this start? So if they come in with neck pain, well, it started when I hit my head on the pipe in the basement. Well, maybe you broke something. If it just started, I woke up with it, and you can probably ignore it. Uh, so the treatment of all things spine. And this is an important slide. Uh, observation, which is kind of benign neglect. Uh, activity modification does not mean bed rest. Well, if it hurts when you do that, stop doing that uh, and give it some time. So uh, overall, activity modification, medications, therapy, injections, and surgery. And this is kind of the whole bag of tricks. And we call that usual care. So all the studies in spine, they always say patients failed 6 to 12 weeks of usual care. And they never defined usual care because it's just whatever you usually do. And for the most part, it usually doesn't matter. Uh, so the treatment of neck pain, you know, medications, muscle relaxers. I, I don't give out a lot of muscle relaxers, but sometimes if you see somebody whose head is kind of twisted to one side and they have muscle spasm, uh, narcotics, I give out almost no narcotics. Um, and, you know, a couple days' worth of narcotics can ruin your life. So, so I don't really do that. Uh, oral steroids, nobody dies without a trial of steroids. Uh, people feel better when you give them steroids. Collars, somewhat anecdotal. Uh, Posture and ergonomics, my wife says, my neck hurts. I'm like, well, you spend nine hours a day looking at your phone. And there is a, a word for that. It's called tech neck. Put down your phone. 
Uh, physical therapy, people like physical therapy because people always want to feel like they're contributing to their recovery. Just like my mother thinks that you need antibiotics for head cold because she's contributing to her recovery. It doesn't really matter, but people like that. There's very little indication for injections for neck pain. Uh, so we're going to sum up neck pain is that most of these things get better. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about cervical herniations because these are things that, that we can help with. Uh, a herniated disc, for the most part, you get arm pain more than neck pain. You get nerve symptoms. And the pain follows an anatomic distribution. You get weakness or numbness. Radiculopathy means nerve root dysfunction, and myelopathy means spinal cord dysfunction. And there'll be more slides to review that, but if you remember nothing else, radiculopathy is nerve root, myelopathy is spinal cord. Uh, and then the mechanism of injury. So when did the pain start? What were you doing? Uh, oh, yeah, I was in a car accident. Oh, I fell down the stairs. Uh, sometimes you have this prodrome of neck pain followed by arm pain. The vast majority of patients come in with their arm over their head, and they say, I wasn't doing anything. I just woke up like this. So for radiculopathy, it's a single nerve, nerve root. And this, you can get sensory changes, so numbness, tingling. You can get referred pain. Uh, the spine is very simple. The spine is really like a wiring diagram. Uh, so we'll think this is actually the circuit breaker for my basement. And I know if I flick this switch that the AC goes off, and it's labeled. Now, the spine is not labeled, but if you remember the wiring diagram, then you can figure it out. Uh, and remember, anatomy is the only thing that will never change in my whole career. So as long as you memorize that, you get a couple of questions on the exam. This is the referred pain pattern in the back of the neck. So you do get this pain in the back of the neck from the cervical spine. Uh, and again, the exam is just a wiring diagram. You remember the wiring diagram? Uh, five, six. I'm not expecting you to memorize this. Uh, but this is something that you should be able to remember. And patients say all the time, he only examined me for less than two minutes. I mean, how long is it going to take me to examine six muscles? Uh, but these are things that you should know, because I get calls all the time. The arm is weak. I'm like, well, what's weak? Uh, and it's very simple. It's deltoid, bicep, tricep, wrist extensors, finger flexors, hand intrinsics. And those are basically all the nerves that come out of the neck. Uh, compression tests, so if you press on their head and they get shooting pain down the arm, the arm pain's probably coming from the head. Um, long track signs, everybody remember long track signs? Uh, so negative, positive. Uh, Oppenheim, you scratch the, uh, you press on the tibia and the big toe goes up. Uh, Hoffman sign, if you extend the long finger and flex the nail, the other fingers flex, and that's a long track sign. And this is a nice slide to put in. Uh, I'm not sure where I got it from. Uh, but there's descending inhibition of the reflex arc. So if you get hyperreflexia in the legs, you get four plus knee jerk. Uh, this tract is where the brain diminishes the reflex. So if you disconnect that, then the reflex goes up. So the difference between radiculopathy and myelopathy, uh, radiculopathy we talked about, the pain follows a dermatomal distribution. Myelopathy, you get more long track signs. You get loss of dexterity, gait disturbance, bowel and bladder stuff. Uh, so overall, radiculopathy is favorable, myelopathy is less favorable. The natural history, so what happens if you do nothing? Because uh, it's important to know. Now, this is what happens when you produce your talk and you start it on two different computers, and then you try to merge them together, and they have different defaults, and you get something like this. I wasn't expecting this to happen. Uh, so you have to rule out other things, like median nerve, carpal tunnel will give you C6-like symptoms, uh, thoracic outlet, brachial plexopathy, Parsonage Turner, that's that post-viral where your arm, you have shoulder pain, and then you get weakness in the arm, uh, shoulder disease, and cervical angina I put here for completeness. Uh, so this is an MRI. MRI, this is a cross-section picture. So you can get herniation of the nuclear material. So there's the disc, there's the spinal cord, and that's the exiting nerve root. Now this looks like disc, but it's not. That's like a bony ridge. Either one irritates the nerve. Uh, this is uh, acute, you can see by the bright color. And this is chronic, it looks more like bone because it's dark. Uh, so what's the etiology of myelopathy? If you press on the spinal cord, it doesn't really work. If you occlude the blood vessels, you have issues with the spinal cord. And then it's more of a combination. So there's not a lot of room. There's room for spinal cord, blood, and spinal fluid, just like the brain. So if you press on it, you decrease blood flow, you increase pressure, and you disrupt the spinal cord. Uh, other things for cervical myelopathy, this is just sort of that list of differential diagnosis. 
I remember tertiary syphilis. You can always think about tertiary syphilis. Remember syphilis? I asked, I asked the patient, have you ever had syphilis? He said, no, but I've had gonorrhea. Not helpful. <laughs> so what's the natural history? This is the paper that everybody talks about. This is the, the original paper by Clark, is that 25% were episodic worsening, 20% slow progression, and 5% rapid onset with lengthy disability. So based on this, everybody jumps on myelopathy. Uh, that's an old paper. Um, this is kind of the paper I would look at. What's the non-surgical follow-up? Patients with mild spinal cord compression with some signal change in MRI. Because I see patients all the time who say, I was told that I could step off the curve and get paralyzed. Or if I'd be paralyzed if I was in a car accident. And people get paralyzed in car accidents all the time who have normal necks. So that's not a good indication for surgery. So what happens if you uh, sort of follow these patients? This is a Japanese paper. Paper. This was 45 patients. Two patients had minor trauma and did wind up with spinal cord injury. So it was two out of 45, so it was 4%. So that's your risk, 4% risk. 82% at five years were pretty much stable. And 50%, 56% at 10 years were pretty much stable. And if you take out the two that had trauma, it's 60% at 10 years. So it's not an emergency. It's something that you have to advise patients on. Uh, so work up. The patient comes into your office with arm pain, and how do you work that up? Uh, so I always get x-rays. You can see a lot of things on x-rays. You can see fractures, instability, spondylosis, which just means arthritis, and you can see alignment. Like this patient has a, a kyphotic alignment to their neck, and this patient's pretty normal. And your treatment options may be different in the operating room if they pitch forward a little bit. Uh, MRI is kind of the test of choice. Uh, it gives you detailed evaluations of discs in the nerve. So here's a spinal cord, and here's a disc pressing on the cord. And here it is in cross-section. Here's your cord, here's a disc pressing on the cord, and these are the vertebral arteries on the sides. It's non-invasive. There's no known risks, although there was a, a lawsuit in Philadelphia where a patient says that she can no longer read minds after going through the MRI. That was subsequently dismissed. Uh, it's widely available. We have 10 MRIs in Morristown alone. Uh, but all MRIs are not equal. This is the MRIs we saw years ago, and this is kind of what we have now. Uh, and they both show you MRIs, but clearly the detail here is not the same. Uh, and that's why you have to look at the pictures yourself. A myelogram, I put this here as a, um, a sort of historical reference. I mean, we used to do this test before MRIs. Well, when all the MRIs looked like that, we'd get a lot of myelograms. Today, we don't. But you put a needle in the back, you inject some dye, you turn them upside down, and then put them through the CAT scan. Uh, very limited indications, but you know, comparing MRI to CT myelogram, that's kind of what it is. Here you can see the spinal cord. Here you see where the dye is not, but you can't actually see the spinal cord itself. Uh, EMGs, I don't think this is a particularly useful test. It's very unpleasant. You put needles in the arm and you pulse electricity through it. I mean, it's about as unpleasant as it sounds. Uh, and I don't think it's any better than my physical exam, but I think my physical exam is pretty reliable. So if you have a herniated disc and the pain follows that disc, as long as you memorize the wiring diagram, I don't see any need for that. But if you think you have some double crush, so if you think a patient might have carpal tunnel or you're not really sure if it's carpal tunnel, or patients who come in and they have pain and you really can't explain it at all, sometimes they'll get an EMG, or weakness that you can't explain. But for the most part, I don't order a lot of these. Uh, so when do you get imaging? Well, the problem is that patients want to get MRIs before they come to the office for the first time. They want you to order it before you see them. And that's not a good idea. Uh, but six to 12 weeks of usual care. And whatever you usually do is fine. Uh, if they don't get better. So patients who are progressive deficits, so if their arm is getting weaker and weaker, you probably should image that. And then patients who are myelopathic, myelopathy you should work up. If patients got clonus and upgoing toes, that's not something I would, I would sit on. Uh, so again, back to treatments of all things spine. Observation, activity modification, medicine, therapy, injections, and surgery. The same bag of tricks that we had for, for neck pain. Uh, so non-operative treatment, we kind of talked about this. And, and I think tincture of time is important. You just have to support patients, and some of them will get better by themselves. Uh, epidurals, uh, there is supporting evidence for epidurals uh, for cervical radiculopathy. There is no supporting evidence for neck pain. Uh, but the risk is certainly higher than the lumbar spine. And it's not every patient with neck pain goes to pain management. Everybody gets an injection because you keep them distracted, the ones who are going to get better anyway, but at least they feel like they're contributing to their care. 
So this is a patient who had nonspecific neck pain. He had a cervical epidural, and he had a hematoma that went from here to here, uh, and he became acutely quadriplegic after his epidural. This is not a procedure that carries with it zero risk. The risk is small, but the things that happen can be catastrophic. So keep that in mind. Uh, so he had emergent surgery, and he got everything back, but he wound up with a big operation uh, that he probably didn't need or probably never would have had. Um, so I want to talk about surgery a little bit. We're going to talk about anterior cervical discectomy infusion. We'll talk a little bit about disc replacements. And we'll leave posterior cervical procedures here. This is 95 to 98 percent of the surgeries that we do. So I'm not going to talk a lot about posterior cervical procedures. And we can talk about that during some of the breakout sections if anybody's interested. So this is a cartoon. This is an MRI. So here's the disc pressing on the nerve. This is the front, so there's your chin, and this is the back of the neck. So the disc is up front, and patients don't really understand that we're going to go through the front of your neck to get to your spine. But here it is, and you can see getting it out from there is pretty easy. Uh, so when do you send patients for surgery? So we'll start here. There's the failure of non-operative treatment or the usual care, progressive deficit. Some patients just can't ride it out. I mean, there are some people who say, I can't live like this for another minute, and it's just inhumane. Uh, weakness, I'm going to put this here, weakness next to patient factors. So if you're a, a middle-aged accountant and you have weakness in your tricep and the only one who notice it is me, that's probably not going to be a functional loss if it's your non-dominant arm and you do desk work. And you can probably live your whole life with a little bit of trace weakness in your tricep. If you have weakness in your deltoid and you can't get your hand to your mouth, that's a problem. If you're a laborer and you have weakness in your dominant deltoid, that's a huge problem. If you have a little bit of weakness and you don't notice it, that's something I could sit on. And patients with progressive myelopathy, although as we learned, myelopathy you can watch for a while as long as it's not too bad. So this is the landmark paper, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery from 1958. Look at that, Smith Robinson. It's amazing how they did this. They perfected it on dogs, and then they tried it on people. Uh, and they had great results for this sort of trial run. Uh, 14 patients, 22 discs, and this is 80% good to excellent results. So they went in through the front, they took out the disc, they put a little piece of bone in that they took from the hip, and then they put them in a collar. And they kind of guessed at the levels based on myelograms and oil-based dyes. And it's like amazing work. And, and it's gone largely unchanged today. I mean, think about it. Today we have better equipment. So here's the disc and the disc pressing on the nerve. So we take out the disc. We make an incision through the front, move the esophagus out of the way, trachean esophagus one way, carotid out of the other way. You take out the disc, you put a piece of bone in, lock it into the plate. This whole thing takes about 40 minutes. And it's uh, sort of largely unchanged since 1958. We've just gotten better at it. So we'll show some cases just to illustrate. A 42-year-old male warehouse worker loading pallets, develops neck and right arm pain, and weakness in his bicep and wrist extensor. And that's C6, for those of you who haven't memorized the wiring diagram. And he failed 12 weeks of usual care. And here's what we did. We made a neck incision, took out the disc, put a little piece of bone, a little plate. Overnight in the hospital, I keep everyone overnight just because I'm neurotic, but you really could go home the same day. And this, was a home, this is a home run operation. 38-year-old male with four months of right upper extremity pain, C6 and C7, weakness in his right tricep, C7, absent right tricep and biflex reflexes, so that's C6, C7. And here's his MRI. So he had two-level disc herniation, and he had a little bit of a kyphotic alignment. He kind of held his head forward. And uh, overnight in the hospital, two-level disc. This is a super reliable operation. And these are just some intraoperative pictures. Here's the head, here's the feet, there's a disc, and there's the graft. And here's the, the final product. Um, so where have we gone from 1958 to today? Well, we have bone banks. So we don't have to take bone out of people's hips. Uh, they're machined. We do have cages. I'm not a big fan of cages. The failure rate of cages is five times higher than the failure rate of bone. Uh, we have microscopes. We have lighting. We have LED headlights, just like on my car. Uh, we have power tools, which they didn't have in 1958, air power drills. We have neuromonitoring, so we've made it safer. We have plates. They didn't have plates in 1958. And the advantage of the plate is that you can return to function fairly quickly. You don't have to put them in a collar, and you can let them get back to their life. I mean, I wouldn't let them operate a jackhammer, but you can go back to being an accountant in a week or two. It's a great operation, but it's gone largely unchanged. We've just gotten better at it. Now, what happens when you fuse someone's neck? So if you take out two discs, you transfer stress above and below. And Alan Hillebrand looked at Henry Bowman's work, and 
2.9% per year over 10 years will develop arthritis above or below effusion. And those are the consequences. Uh, surprisingly, if you did more than one, if you did multiple levels, there was less adjacent level breakdown than if you did just one. Um, uh, so now there's a push to preserve motion. And the theory behind preserving motion is that you would, yes? Five minutes. We're pretty close, right? Good. So, uh, so we preserve motion. These are disc replacements. And um, disc replacement, it's essentially the same operation, but we put this mobile device to try to protect the level above or below. And the results of these are as good or slightly better. This device is FDA approved for two levels. You can't do more than two levels. Um, so we'll just show a couple of quick slides and we'll be done on time, as promised. Uh, Six-year-old male progressive loss of dexterity of bilateral upper extremity. Balance disturbance, it just kind of feels funny. He has intrinsic wasting in his hand and bilateral up going toes. So we all kind of know where this is going, right? Uh, so here's a picture of him. He's got cervical spondylotic myelopathy. That's an arthritic spur, uh, an arthritic disc herniation, and it's a big bright spot in his cord. This is somebody that you would, you would steer towards surgery because they're myelopathic and they're symptomatic. Uh, 52 year right hand dominant male presents with right upper extremity pain, lateral arm, radial forearm into the thumb. That's C6, if you go back to the wiring diagram. And his exam is remarkable only for diminished right bicep reflex, C6. And here's his MRI. So he's got multi-level cervical stenosis. He's got no signal change in his cord. And he's got, his exam is really not particularly remarkable. So let's just take some thoughts. Surgery or no surgery? Nobody cares. So. Uh, he recovered uneventfully with usual care. So we just kind of keep him distracted. And he got better within six weeks. There's really no reason to do anything. And I, he came with this MRI because people like MRIs, but I probably wouldn't have ordered it. I would have just watched it. And if he got better, it's better if he doesn't know. 29-year-old uh, right-hand dominant female with three weeks in bilateral upper extremity uh, numbness, subtle loss of dexterity, absent bi bicep reflex, C6 again. Four plus lower extremities, no clonus, no Babinski. And you know, you really, do you have any difficulty signing your name, tying your shoes, buttoning buttons? And I got like a, well, maybe. That's not a definitive yes, but it's not a no. So here's her MRI. And this is an acute soft herniation. The bright signal shows you that it's acute. Here's the spinal cord. Here's the herniation. It is pressing on the cord a little bit. So here's your options. You can do usual care. You can do anterior cervical fusion, or you could do a disc replacement. So show of hands, usual care, fusion, disc replacement, who doesn't care? All right, so the answer for her is she's not been done being tortured. So I'm going to torture her for 12 weeks or maybe more because she's very young. And if she gets better, we'll do nothing. There's really very little downside in waiting. Uh, and the girls in the office say, aren't you going to operate on her? I'm like, I'm not done torturing her yet. Uh, because if you keep people distracted long enough, a lot will get better anyway. Uh, so if you leave nothing else, when do you refer? No one? Oh, come on. So uh, you refer, it depends on your comfort level. Right? If you're comfortable watching it and you feel confident in your physical exam, uh, then you can watch it. Anybody who's got progressive deficit, uh, I would refer that. Anybody who's myelopathic, I probably would refer because I wouldn't want to own it. Uh, just like if I get an abnormal EKG, I'm not going to own that. Uh, persistent symptoms. So patients who fail 12 weeks of usual care, whatever you usually do. And then you get this problem, like, what do you do with test results? Because a lot of these MRI reports come back as cord compression. And everybody panics, cord compression. So remember, cord compression is not something to panic unless somebody is progressively getting worse. If they're relatively stable, you can watch it. But you probably should have somebody else own it. Because I'm, I'm not owning the abnormal EKG, and you probably shouldn't own cord compression. Uh, uh, and remember that spondylosis is part of aging. Positive MRIs may mean nothing more than gray hair. Neck pain usually gets better. Radiculopathy you can observe with usual care. And myelopathy we do tend to treat more aggressively. And I'll just kind of leave you with this. Niels Bohr, one of the fathers of the atomic bomb, said, an expert is a man who has made all the mistakes which can be made in a narrow field. So at this point of my career, I am a near expert. <laughs> Thank you.
questions? Yes. Chiropractic care? Uh, there is some evidence that chiropractic care helps for low back pain in uh, acute settings. I think it's the chronic maintenance chiropractic care. I don't think there's any evidence to support that. For, non for neck pain, it makes me more nervous. Uh, there's just not a whole lot of room there. Now, as you get older, your vertebral arteries start to get more calcified. So if you rapidly thrust someone's neck, you can shear off a vertebral artery. So patients over 60, there is an association with stroke. So I wouldn't let anybody crack my neck. But as far as cracking your low back, it, it probably won't hurt and it might help. Yes? That's a great question. People ask me all the time, what do you think about inversion tables? And I said, if we were supposed to be upside down, then the veins in our neck would have valves so the blood wouldn't pool in your head. <laughs> and since the veins in my neck don't have valves, we're not supposed to be upside down. Uh, general surgical, cervical traction, I think, is valuable. I don't think inversion table, there's any science behind that. But people do seem to like uh, traction. But gentle traction, I wouldn't pull too hard. Yes? For acute pain, no. And uh, the evidence coming out that it's probably less valuable than we think. But people like to give out gabapentin because people don't want to give out narcotics anymore. And patients all want to get prescriptions, just like my mother always wants antibiotics. I think for chronic neuropathic pain, there's probably some value. I think for acute pain, there's not. I don't give it out a lot for that. And there is an interaction. Patients who have addictive potential, gabapentin and narcotics together is dangerous. Yes? I'm not saying that they're no good. I'm just that the, there's a paper last month in Spine where they looked at single level anterior cervical fusions, cages versus allograft, and the pseudarthrosis rate. So the failure of fusion rate on a cervical cage was 5%. The failure on a fusion from an allograft or a bone was 1%. So while the, the numbers are very small, there's no upside to putting in a cage over a piece of bone and only downside. And it's three times the price. So for a lot of reasons, putting cages in someone's neck makes no sense to me. Because we have milled allograft and the healing rate is five times, you know, the, the failure rate is five times lower. Anyone? Thank you very much. Oh, yes. One more question. Sorry. Yes. Acute back pain. Uh, no one has ever compared usual care. No one's ever looked at steroids alone, NSAIDs alone. No one's ever looked at oral steroids versus injected steroids or epidurals. Because these are questions that the pain people don't really want to know. I give out a lot of steroids. I think steroids, people feel better when they take steroids. That's been my experience. Provided they don't have any other risk factors like diabetes or ulcer disease or things like that. Thank you very much.